Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, divide intervals into minimum number of groups. So an interval problem. And before we even get started, I wanna mention that this is actually similar to a, another leak code problem that we have solved before. I believe it's meeting rooms two. And yes, that problem happens to be a neat code 150 problem. So if you go to neat code IO, neat code 150, go down to the intervals section, this problem, is pretty much exactly the same problem. So that's why I always say the fundamentals are very, very important. Anyways, though, I'm going to still be explaining this problem from scratch. So if you haven't solved this problem, don't worry about it. Now, the idea is that we're given some intervals, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw them out over here. So we have one interval from five to 10 inclusive. So that means that these endpoints are circled in because these values are included in that interval. We also have six to eight, we have one to five, two to three, so I'll put that over here. And we have one to 10, so I'll draw that down here actually. I'll go through how this problem is worded and then I'll tell you a better way to actually interpret this problem. It says that we're given these intervals. We want to divide them into groups where each interval only falls into one group and where each interval does not overlap or they use the word intersect with any of the other intervals. So just looking at this interval over here, this one, do you think we could include it with this one? Would they be in the same group? Probably not because they overlap. And a quick edge case is what about these two intervals? Can they be included in the same group? Well, the endpoints overlap. So technically these two do intersect. So sometimes they will actually allow you to count these as not intersecting. But in this example, they make it very clear that these two intervals would overlap. So what would be the minimum number of groups that we could make with these? Well, just looking at this, we could, let's say this one down here, it intersects with pretty much all of these. So it has to go in its separate group. So that's one. These intersect and these intersect and these intersect. So we could group these two together and then we could group this one with this one. So we could do this in three groups. That looks like the minimum number of groups just from visualizing this. Now, generally with these types of problems, you wanna take the input and then sort it and then scan through it. That in this case is not quite gonna be enough. You can try to come up with a solution doing that, but a better approach is to think of it in this way. The minimum number of groups, well, just by looking at these intervals over here, I mean, for sure, we're gonna need at least three. At minimum, we're gonna need three because look at it, these three intervals, they intersect each other. Each of them has to go in a separate group. Let's say this one goes in group one, this one goes in group two, this one goes in group three. Now, this one can also go in group two, it can't go in group three, of course, and this one, can't go in group three, nor can it go in group two, but it can go in group one. Instead of though, thinking of it in this terms, like trying to identify which interval is gonna go inside which group, we could just think of it this way. Just imagine you have like this line and you're just moving it through this list of intervals at any given point, we're tracking the number of intervals that we have. So like as we go here, we have two intervals. And as we get to this stretch, we have three intervals intersecting. And then here we have two. Here briefly at this point, we have three. And then we go back to two. Here we have three. Here we have two. And then we're done. So if you scan through it like that, what was the maximum number of intersecting intervals at any given point in time. Well, the max that we saw at any given point was three. That's a little bit different than the way this problem is worded. And I think it's more simple to think of it in like this inverse term. What's the minimum number of groups that you need? Well, that's determined by what's the maximum number of intersections at any given point in time, because the intersections are what determine that we need an additional group at that point. Because two intervals, of course, can't be in the same group if they intersect. So now that I've told you that the problem can be solved by doing it that way, how would you approach it? Well, we mainly have access to these endpoints. We can't literally move a line through this. So we'll look at the starting points. 
We're still going to kind of go through this in sorted order, and I'll show you exactly how we're going to do that. But just for the intuition, look at this. We have a starting point here. So we clearly have one interval right now, and we have another starting point here. So now we have two intervals just from the beginning. We scan through, going through all the points in sorted order. Now we have another starting point. So there's three meetings, or I used the wrong word, meeting, which uh, is kind of like the meeting rooms problem. We have three groups, sorry, going on right now. And then what's the next point in sorted order? It's this point. It's not a starting point. It's actually an ending point. An ending point tells us that a interval came to an end. So this is no longer a part of the group. So at this point, we only have two intervals. We go to the next point in sorted order. We actually have a tie over here. Based on the description of the problem, specifically this part, what do you think we should do? Which one of these do you think we should favor? When we have a tie, should we favor the ending point first or the starting point first? Probably the starting point. Because right now, we have two intervals. If we do the ending point first, we'll say that we have one interval and then we'll visit this one next and then we'll say we have two intervals, but that's not correct because at this point we actually had three intervals. So when there is a tie, we should probably count the starting point first. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. So, so far we've seen one, two, three, four starting points and one ending point. So we have three intervals ongoing at this point in time, which looks correct to me. There looks like there's three intervals. Then we do the ending point. So then we're at two intervals. Then we do the starting point. We're back to three intervals. Looks correct. Then the ending point uh, in sorted order, two intervals, and then the last two ending points. And then we end with zero. Now you saw me visualize the solution. This solution, since we're going through the points in sorted order, can be implemented in n log n time. That's the sorting, and then we just scan through it. That's the linear time part. In terms of how to code it, there are multiple ways, I believe. The one that I prefer is like this. While we could put all of the points into a single array, we would still need to distinguish, like let's say we had one, two, three, we would need to distinguish which one of these numbers are startings and which one of them are endings. So the solution that I prefer is to actually split it into two arrays. So I'll have one array, which is going to include all the starting points, and then I'll have another array, which is going to include all the ending points. Let me just kind of quickly draw that for this example. It looks like we would have one, one, two, five, and six, because one, one, two, five, six. And then the ending points, I believe, are going to be three, five, eight, and then I think we have two tens. Now that I've split this into two arrays, you probably know where I'm going. We're going to do a two-pointer approach where I'm going to have one pointer in the starting array and one pointer in the ending array. When the value in the starting array is smaller, that's the one we're going to pick. We're going to pick whichever array has a smaller value. So this one has a smaller one. So we're going to shift the pointer now over here. We're going to say, okay, we have one interval right now. So we're going to keep track of that. And I'm just going to call that, let's say groups. So that'll be one now. Our pointer is over here. This is smaller than this one still. So this pointer will be shifted again. And then groups will be incremented to two. Now, once again, when there is a tie, inevitably there's going to be a tie sometimes. So so let's say the pointer was here and the pointer was here. What do you think we would do? Once again, we would favor the starting point rather than the ending because we don't want to undercount the solution. So here we would shift this pointer. Now that I think of it, we probably don't even need to actually keep track of groups. That's how I coded it up the first time. But just by visualizing this, I can kind of tell by uh, this that the distance between these two pointers would actually be what tells us how many groups we have ongoing like this pointer minus this pointer. And we would expect that the starting pointer would always be ahead of or equal to the ending pointer because every interval, I believe like let's say we have like the left point and the right point of each interval, the left point is always gonna be less than or equal to the right point. So we would never expect the ending pointer to get ahead of the starting pointer. But I think those are all the details that we need to know to solve this problem. So let's code it up now. So first thing I'm going to do is separate all the elements in the intervals. Like I'm going to separate them into two arrays, the starting points and the ending points. Not super difficult to do that. I'm going to go through for every left point and every right point in the intervals. I'm unpacking those two points for each interval. And I'm going to say start.append left and then end.append right. Now, after that, we're going to do the expensive part, which is actually sorting each of these arrays. So something like that. And now we're going to do the two-pointer approach. 
I'm not good at naming, so I'm just going to stick with the classic I and J. Let's say I refers to the starting array and J refers to the ending array. And then I'm going to have my result, which is zero. The first time I code this, I'm just going to actually do it the explicit way where we keep track of the groups, just in case there's like a beginner watching this who skipped the drawing explanation. Some people do that for some reason. I don't know why. But then we're going to check while we are in bounds. Do I really need to do that for both pointers? Do I need to do this and say J is in bounds? Because remember, the I pointer is always going to be ahead or equal to the J pointer. And when there's a tie between these two, the I pointer is going to be the one that's incremented because it's the one that corresponds to the starting array. So I actually don't need the second one. I only need the first one. And then I'm just going to do the comparison. If the value in the starting array is less than or equal to the value in the ending array at pointer J, that's when I'm going to increment the number of groups and I'm then going to shift the I pointer. If that's not the case, though, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to decrement the number of groups because one of the groups just came to a close, and then we're going to shift the J pointer. Now, how do we update the result? Well, we want to know what's the max number of groups that we had at any given point in time. So we're always going to set the result to the max of itself, as well as the groups that we're keeping track of, and then we're going to return the result. So this is the entire solution. Let's go ahead and give it a go. And you can see that it works and it's pretty efficient. Now for that small little optimization I was talking about, we don't need to keep track of the groups. I'm gonna get rid of this and I'm gonna get rid of this and I'm gonna get rid of this and I'm gonna update this to be I minus J. Let's think if that's actually correct. I believe it is because when we start, both of the pointers are at the same position, and that would tell us that there's zero groups ongoing. If we incremented i by one, that would tell us that there's one group ongoing, and the math works out. So I think that's right. Let's give it a go. And running it, you can see it works, and it's also pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, definitely check out neatcode.io for a lot more. I think it's worth your time. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.